Okay, so we'll just start very briefly, uh, very slowly as well, as we have people joining us. Uh, I can see people are, are arriving, so that's good. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody uh, from the uh, SOA Center of African Studies that I'm uh, representing here. I'm the manager of the SOA Center of African Studies. My name is Angelica Basquiera, and I've been working on bringing uh, to SOA the collaboration uh, with the um, Victorian Albion Museum around the artist uh, talk series that we are um, showing to you today. Um, I, the series has been very important to us at SOAS and my colleague, Esbeth Court, who is here, uh, she will uh, tell more about the series, how it came about, and, um, and uh, uh, to welcome all of you today to the, um, the, we are still a little bit confused if it's the third or the fourth event in the series, because uh, uh, the series has been so popular that uh, other events have been sort of pop up around, which is fantastic, <laughs> uh, because the more the better. And um, so it's been extremely successful so far. And we are uh, very, very pleased that today um, we actually have uh, artists from Kenya joining us uh, um, online. Um, and it's really great to be able to have this reach um, with Siouia Kiambi today with us and Don Handa as well. Uh, as Beth Kot, my colleague, will introduce them in more detail. So that's why I'm not saying too much. Uh, about them, but uh, Elsbeth uh, will uh, uh, very shortly, as soon as uh, most of our attendees have joined us, um, she will then um, um, speak in more in more detail. Um, hold on. Um, got it. Someone is trying to. No, we need to move away. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry. And uh, yes, yeah, so um, we have quite a lot of attendees, as I said. Thank you so much for all for coming. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things. The event is recorded. It's going to be available on the SOAS YouTube channel in, um, in the next few days. He, um, also, when it comes to the Q&A, we're going to have presentation today. And then we're going to have a, um, a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. And please put your question in the Q&A chat that you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we will aim to um, answer as many questions as we can, uh, given the time. But if you just write them in there, uh, the panelists will be able to see them. Uh, OK, now, without further ado, I think we have quite um, a, a lot of people in. And I'm sure more will join us. Uh, but I will now uh, pass on to my colleague, Elsbeth, who will tell you more about the series and more about Esiu Wiyakiambi, our artist today, and Don Handa as well, our discussant. discussant. So welcome and thank you so much, everybody. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, An Angelica. Uh, let me say, uh, Karibuni Wote, we're uh, sharing this session from Nairobi. It's the only one of the events which is actually taking place on the African continent. Uh, which I, makes me very happy uh, to 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 be the chair of this section uh, session. We've been organizing it for over a year. I'll get into that for a minute. In a minute, um, the series uh, is a collaboration between SOAS and the Victorian Albert Museum. I wanted to just say that it, it's a very special exhibition for the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's known or is the leading museum for art, design and performance in Great Britain, perhaps uh, the largest in Europe, that perhaps debatable. Uh, but it's only recently that there's been this emphasis on uh, African material and this particular exhibition, Africa Fashion, has the central uh, showing space uh, in the museum. And in a way is a, a COVID miracle because the, the curators for the exhibition uh, devised it and pulled it together during, during the COVID period. So it's watershed for the, the v &A in terms of the uh, exhibition itself. And also, I think the procedure by which the exhibition um, was devised and carried out, which was largely uh, online, because again, it was during during COVID. Uh, it's an exciting exhibition to me because it deals with the generations of the uh, independence era in throughout Africa over a number of years, and also textile traditions. And it compares that generation with uh, the current creatives, which have been very much the center of attention. Uh, 
uh, in in generating the exhibition. So it's very positive uh, approach. Uh, it's celebratory because it it is this watershed, and it's celebratory uh, also in honoring uh, the creatives who who are on the the sort of second story of the exhibition. Now, in contrast, SOAS has been teaching African art since the early 1980s, a specialism in art history. Uh, we've been having artist talks uh, since the early 90s and some rather fabulous uh, collaborations. In my opinion, this is a particularly outstanding collaboration uh, because of my interest in textiles. And Angelica and I saw the uh, call out. We said uh, we would really like to uh, enter into a collaboration with the VNA on this to uh, expand the topic of fashion and its presentism. Uh, let's see what we can do. And we were received well by Christine Krasinska, the lead curator and, and her team. Last January, when I was in Nairobi, I spoke with Siawea. Uh, in my mind, uh, I thought uh, that her practice would fit so well with the idea of expanding the topic of of textile, uh, costume, personal adornment, uh, and fashion uh, with her practice. And I, what she showed me certainly fit with that. And it's the, a piece which she's going to show us in just a minute, a uh, minute or two. Uh, just fit, I felt perfectly. Later in the year, that piece went on, or that project went on to be uh, featured in the Biennale at Venice in the Kenya Pavilion. Which is, which is really quite fantastic. Siwia also visited the uh, exhibition when she was in England in October. So the, all of that, that I've got, she will be showing you, or uh, we will be presenting her presentation. Uh, she's a, probably one of the most well-known Kenyan conceptual and performance artists. List is long in terms of her achievements. Uh, and this is all, really quite wonderful to be, to be sharing her work with you. Uh, her work will be discussed by Don Handa, uh, who's wearing the bright yellow shirt. Uh, last year, I didn't see him in Nairobi because he was off in Kampala. Uh, and then he moved uh, his job from being a manager of the Circle Art Agency, which is a commercial outfit, to the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, institute and visual space uh, to promote uh, and preserve Ken uh, East African, actually, more, more than Kenyan uh, uh, visual arts. Uh, and it, it was established by Michael Harmitage uh, in 2019. And uh, Don will serve as our discussant. So after Siwia's presentation, the screen will be split with Don and Siwia. We'll have his comments, their discussion, and then the Q&A. Uh, so that that's what we expect to happen this evening. We welcome you again, Karibuni Wote, and we move on now to Siwia's uh, presentation. Thank you very much for joining us this evening.
I focus in my practice a lot to do with British history and German history and East African history is evident of this um, Verflechtung. This fabric, even though it was my mother's shirt, also looks a little bit like burlap. And for me, this was an important point in 2009 and 2010 in Kenya. There was a lot of conversations happening steered by the government to do with like a national identity. And for me, the Haitian cloth or the burlap cloth is a cloth that transcends class. I think everybody has kind of interacted with it in one way or another because it's a material that's used for transportation. It's used for in construction sites. It's used in agriculture. Um, so it's one of those boundaryless materials. And then, of course, what's repeated in my process and my thought process particularly is this infiniteness, um, the kind of meshing or blurring of things um, that horizons we don't know about yet can be imagined or reimagined. I'll speak more about that later. Before I go into details of the four works I've kind of selected to speak about in more depth today, I wanted to share with you a few works that are connected to our conversation to do with costumes and clothing. Um, just take this opportunity to quickly go over them. Um, this first one is called Counteraction. And the costume I created is inspired by like a 90s um, kind of futuristic outfit with um, shoulder puffs and this high collar. And the work was really an attempt to meditate, uh, to use meditation as a tool to transcend kind of the violence we experience. The second one I wanted to briefly touch upon is Between Us, which is a trilogy. It's a work I started in 20, well, presented in 2014, but really started earlier than that. And um, the Kaunda suit and um, the businesswoman kind of outfit and this cleaner's outfit were the three main um, images that I referred back to in the installation that are also connected to other works that you'll see. Um, but the Kaunda suit specifically was of superb interest to me. Um, and this is kind of the first body of work where the Kaunda suit appears. And in the trilogy, you have three chapters, and in the first chapter, the Kaunda suit is an observer, is constantly watching, and the female character in the business suit is kind of at a loss, walking into walls, not quite managing. And the costume with the <clears throat> cleaning uniform, which is often used for um, people who work in employment in um, kind of cleaning people's homes in Kenya particularly, uh, she's always uh, cleaning and repairing in all of the three chapters of the work, whereas the other two characters go through a transformation. One, the, the Kaunda suit is kind of um, the male characters ultimately broken down uh, and um, the female character is, starts from a point of breakage and, and goes into a place of repair. This image is just to describe for you that the, there is also the use of um, double-sided mirrors in the work. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of voyeurism and a lot of um, kind of, you don't know who's watching which part when and who sees what, when, how. And there's a cross-observation that's constantly happening in this particular body of work. And the last one I wanted to share before I go into in-depth works is um, 1964 to 2018, which particularly references the Kaunda suits again. And basically, uh, there's an interesting point. So Kaunda suits came about in the 70s and 80s as this post-independence um, business suit that was worn uh, across the African continent, kind of in the liberation moment of like, we can be... Um, businessmen, but also we're in Africa and we don't need a tie and a long sleeves. But what's interesting for me is that this uniform moved from a place of power to a place of employment. So nowadays this uniform is worn in uh, the service industry. And I was interested in this transition of power that's happened between 1964 to 2018. 
here I'll go into more depth about this work. The image that you see at the top is um, me in my studio back in 2011 when I first uh, created the work. And um, it, it uses a sisal costume, several elements, like five projections in total, um, ceramic works that are actually non-fired. Uh, and all the photographs are um, images that I took. And it's a very linear uh, installation and performance. And maybe just to share a little bit in the image of in, me in my studio, you can see like, tiny little orange um, vessels that are the pots and the little crosses I was making, and the costume in the back. Um, my studio is currently like four meters by five meters. And the installation is uh, maximum size is 14 meters by eight meters. So I'm never able to fully create um, what's in my mind. I have to work in, in small stages. And then when I'm in the spaces that I work in, I have the chance to actually um, see what the work in its entirety looks like. Here you have uh, the example of the costume that I created, which is kind of for an entity that was representing um, colonial time in the performative element of the installation. It's made from um, a weaving process that comes from um, Kambani, which is my dad's um, heritage and part of my heritage. We're known for basket weaving, and it's the same methodology that's used, except instead of creating a circular shape, I created like a long, um, I don't know how you call it, like a trail. And then the cotton element was dipped in tea and coffee. And there's references of uh, small curry shells, which is a, a reference to like um, currency pre-colonial time and beads, which was also part of an exchange pre-colonial time and trading systems that existed. I had a hard time um, figuring out the costume for this first part of the performative action where I destroy uh, several vessels um, and I needed to um, create uh, something that, that would reference that time. I didn't feel comfortable wearing like um, traditional skins. And obviously in my research in the photographic element, you're only seeing images from colonial time. There's really no references, visual references from pre-colonial time. Um, so this was my kind of solution for that. I included this image to kind of give you an overview of the entirety of the piece. Um, in the far left side, you've got photographs uh, on the wall and this like headdress that's on the floor, which I actually wear in the performance. The headdress was important for me because I had to kind of cover myself in order to um, be uh, yeah, a little less human because the act is so violent. And on the far right, you have a projection of the actual performance, which is situated inside of the installation. The images, um, the white images behind the ceramic vessels, uh, I don't know if you'll find the connection, but it's basically those photographs I took in 2009 in Mexico that I shared with you at the beginning of this presentation. And uh, the photographs on the floor consist of two different sets one are um, me in the sisal costume twirling round and round, and the others are black and white uh, photographs of clouds that are made into a video. And the last images uh, next to the dressing table or behind the dressing table are images of the second character in the work called Rose. It's her memories of her home. And the work um, is really about Rose coming from a rural space and moving to the city and not quite managing the transition. This slide is just to give you a more detailed view of that particular section. What you're left with at the end of the performance is basically the two costumes suspended. The contemporary woman Rose, uh, she's suspended in the past, uh, hung above the moving images of the 
entity costume that's on the floor. And the entity is hung suspended between the mirror and um, above the black and white clouds, sort of in a void. Here are some images of the performative elements in the work. Um, this set has to do with the first part of that performance, where this character, is, which I'm calling more of an entity, kind of um, hands out these metal crosses and also puts them on the costume that I'm wearing and um, walks through the space and eventually uh, goes to the platform with the ceramic pestles. Here's an overview of the performance in Veals that took place in 2015. And you have um, this moment of destruction. The vessels for me are representative of um, individuals and also like communities that were destroyed from the colonial era. Um, that's why the action of putting these crosses is an important part, which happens in the beginning. It's a reference to the missionary movements that took place in Kenya. This work I've particularly deals with Kenyan history and um, it's supposed to be shown in Kenya. I'm yet to show it in Kenya and I think when I do, I won't be performing it again. Here you have like the second phase of this performance. Um, this is where Rose really comes to life. Um, she's uh, kind of starts with cleaning. Uh, first of all, it's right after I've come out of being the entity and she tries to get ready um, for work. And she does this in front of this mirror and um, makeup stand and behind her are images that I created that represent her mother's home or what kind of where she comes from. She comes from a rural space, but she's moved to the city. And she doesn't quite manage to greet people in the audience. She keeps falling down. And towards the end, she comes across this destruction that happened in the past and she tries to kind of rearrange these vessels uh, and attempt to fix some of them. And um, there's a process of acknowledgement. And finally, the work uh, finishes with, um, you know, I transform from her rose into myself, um, the artist kind of in a, me as the artist in public. And I hang these costumes and um, the suspending of the costumes is important for me. Uh, it's also a repetitive action that happens in my practice. And you have a uh, rose in the past situated on the far left side and the entity kind of in this void and the evidence of this process remaining. The second work I'd like to get into is called I've Heard Many Things About You. Um, these are just some initial sketches I felt I wanted to share. Again, I can never fully work uh, in correct scale for myself. So it's always in parts and a lot of planning and sketching and model making. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background of this project before I go into the kind of details of the work. I was commissioned by the Städtische Galerie in Bremen. They were having an exhibition to do with um, mobility and migration and uh, particularly contemporary African works. And the curator in Bremen is running a space that is funded by um, you know, taxpayers' money. It's a state gallery. And he had a challenge because he had to verify or kind of validate why having a contemporary African exhibition is important in a, in a city like Bremen. And um, he'd seen my work at the National Museum. This was something I produced back in 2008, which was dealing with archives and Kenya's national history. And um, the exhibition was touring. It started in Zimbabwe and then Uganda and then in Bremen. It was kind of part of one of the turn fund um, applications of like group exhibitions. And he asked me if um, I'd be interested in working with the topic of Bremen and the city of Bremen and its connection to Namibia and the German history and the genocide that took place that the Germans committed in Namibia. Um, 
I walked through the city of Bremen, Germany, for four and a half hours, wearing a Herrero dress, which is used today to commemorate the genocide the Germans committed in Namibia between 1904 and 1908. Bremen is a city where Adolf Luderitz was born. You can see a photograph of the now abandoned Luderitz town, Namibia, taken by Mohammed Amin in the 80s. Luderitz was responsible for the extraction of materials from Namibia during colonial rule. The fabric I carry is stitched together, consisting of images taken by photojournalist Mohammed Amin in Namibia during the 80s, and excerpts of letters written by Henrik Witboy to the German and British government. Witboy is a Namibian chief who was persecuted due to his resistance to colonial rule. This is the report I used in my research. It is thought of that this genocide was the precursor or the testing ground for the Holocaust. Both Britain and Germany were involved in controlling the region in the 1900s. The excerpt is written by British government, um, kind of as a document against the Germans. For the walk, I embraced the energy of Woodboy's daughter, Margaret. She was murdered by a German general. Um, they were kind of hunting for Whitboy because obviously killing Whitboy would show their power. Both British and German generals were doing this. Um, and Whitboy was constantly escaping and she was caught in the, in the midst of this. And there's a quote that I found, uh, which I found very powerful. And I kind of felt like I could utilize her energy um, for the performative element of the work. And let me just read the quote for you. I've heard that you've come from over the sea in ship in order to make war on my father. Today, the victory is on your side, but luck is changeable. And if you will take my advice, you will return to your own homes because before long, my father will come down on you like a lion and take his revenge. Just to give it a little bit of context, um, the estimation of her age was between 16 and 17 years old. Um, so I was just, I thought it was so powerful for a teenager in that time who hadn't come across uh, gunpowder weaponry to kind of also stand up to this general. Um, I just found it incredibly powerful. I walked from the Ethnographic Museum past the train station through a part of the city built using the resources provided for by colonization stopping by a church, passing Bismarck Monument and leading to the contemporary gallery in Bremen called the Städtische Galerie Bremen. I use a golden string to highlight the different parts of the text element in the work, things like the year um, 1904, like Henry Whitboy's name, excerpts from his letter, Kind of like a highlighter. And the installation itself consists of like a uh, rope, which is tied using the hangman's noose attached to weighing scales, kind of the weighing scales you'd use in a market a long time ago to weigh um, vegetables or meat products. And the costume that I wear that commemorates the um, genocide, which is worn today, is suspended on a whole clothes hanger. And I don't perform um, the performance in different cities. It's only for Bremen. Um, and the installation then can travel along with a video of the performance as a final output. The side underneath is created by patching different pieces of fabric together. Um, this work, Casper's Playground, um, I think there are some interesting elements we could discuss to do with uh, puppetry and um, tools used to intervene inside of difficult spaces. It's part of a larger body of work. Uh, Kaspala is a character I created that in, is a tool for intervention started in the late 2018 and is kind of still ongoing. I'll be having a solo exhibition with uh, the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute. And um, this is just an, uh, one of the works 
that will be present, but I wanted to include it because the costume, uh, one of them is connected to Coronda suits made by mosquito netting, and also the tool of the puppet and just the general history I think is important to share. Nyaya House was built in 1983 and is the Office of Immigration in Kenya. This is where you get your passport and immigration papers. I can't perform or film in this area, so created a puppet for my character called Kaspala, which is a character I've created that is a trickster character who deals with things that are hard to hear or hard to talk about. For 24 years, during the second president of Kenya's rule, Daniel Arab Moy, the basement of Nyayo House was used as a torture chamber. Kaspala's playground unpacks this time period and commemorates the mother's protests of 1992, the mothers were fighting for the release of their sons who were in captivity in Nyayo House. During this protest, the mothers stripped naked as a last resort on the 10th day of protests. This is when the police walked away. It's deemed as a curse to see a mother naked. The work has two projections and Kaspala as a character, which is an animal, human, male, female, um, enters the space and looks for Nyayo House in order to dissemble Nyayo House. The puppet is used to help Kaspala break down Nyayo House, and in the course of that gets broken and Kaspala fixes the puppet. There's a lot of breakage and repair and repair and breakage that takes place in my practice. Kaspala then finds himself in the midst of this protest. And the character Kaspala transforms and becomes, I guess, myself, protesting in remembrance or in honorance of the mother's protest. I wash the remnants of Kaspala's red ochre from my body at the very end using the Kenyan flag. And the remnants of the performance are left in the form of an installation with a puppet hanging and the shadows and projections along with the costume of Kaspala and the costume that I wear that commemorates the mother's protest. And lastly, I want to share origins. Um, this is also part of Kaspale. Um, this is to do with Kaspale's origins, kind of the most recent output of um, this ongoing four year long project. And um, the fabrics, I think, well, I'm trying to share a few process shots with you because um, it's printed on flag material, which means you can see through both sides. It has sound inside of it, and it's an immersive installation. And um, the thought process towards Origins was that I had lots of different conversations about this building a space, which is a landscape. It's also an imagined space. It's inspired by mangroves. It's got uh, kaleidoscopic uh, references. Um, Mangroves is kind of a space I decided Kaspala comes from because it's this in-between space. It's um, a magical space in a sense, uh, trees living in water, <laughs> uh, surviving. Uh, the seed survives in both fresh water and salt water, travels for a year before it actually settles. Um, and um, yeah, there's lots of other layers to do with like imagined landscapes, which we can get into a discussion, but I just wanted to share a little bit about the, the making process before I go into the work. On the left side, one of the prints, there's some um, actually 36 of these uh, in, in the entirety of the work. Each print is um, 370 centimeters by 145 centimeters and um, they're digital collages of uh, mangroves made to become kaleidoscopic. And the image of the right is just there to give you kind of a scale uh, of the work. And it's a space you can walk uh, inside of and around and through. There are two different entries and exits 
and the audio sound is positioned on the inside of the work. Um, so you kind of feel and hear this breath that happens when you walk past the fabric also can move. And you've also got like this natural sound of um, birds in nature. Here you can see the installation from one entry point. Uh, it's pretty hard to document, so I'll share a couple of like detail shots as well. The drawings are of Caspale's ancestors. Um, the space is really um, kind of like a shrine. Um, even though Caspale themselves are not present in the work, um, this is to do with their origins and space where they gain their power. And these ancestors are drawn with oil pastels on silk screen printing mesh. So they have a sculptural element as well. They're quite firm, but they're also translucent. So you can see them from both sides. Again, what's present in this work that was also present in Caspala's playground is the element of shadow work. Um, because of the flag material, you can actually see through from one side to the other, even though it's kind of double layered. Um, again, there's a, you know, with the drawings, you're seeing the front and the back. With the prints, you're seeing the front and the back. So there's a lot of play with uh, depth in that sense. There's also just a detail of kind of the bottom half of some of these um, ancestors. They're like um, quite light and uh, I don't know how you say like I want to say floofy, but it's not floofy. It's like um, feathery, uh, whereas the top is quite heavy. The head is quite heavy um, and the body is kind of floaty. And this last image I wanted to share just for the sake of conversation. I love this image. Um, I found this banana in a supermarket in Kenya. Um, and DZ2 is just, it says basically banana, you know. Um, but these bananas come from Kampala, from Uganda, and, uh, you know, the border, they can't, if you have a split banana, it can't cross the border. But I just love the fact that a uh, banana fiber was used and stitched to seal this kind of split that was happening with the banana in order for the export to take place. And um, I just think it's a lovely uh, a lovely action, and it's also a lovely action in terms of how we are dealing with the importation and exportation of food and the expectations around that. Um, but again, also, I'm just totally in love with the stitching. So I wanted to share that. Thanks for your time. Hi, good evening, Sylvia. Good evening, Hi. everyone. Um, thank you very much for that lovely presentation. Um, thank you for walking us through the content and the thinking behind these works, which um, strike me as key moments in your practice. Um, and I think it's um, a good sort of overview and perhaps an introduction for some of our viewers to your practice. Um, mm -hmm. A practice that's obviously very sort of research, but it's also really attentive to the context and the history and centers the lives of objects and the lives of materials. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also a good starting point for our conversation. Um, I think it really, I'd really like us to get into perhaps a different ways costumes and textiles um, mm -hmm. feature in your work, but also about the kind of transformation that happened as the work evolves and also within the performance. Um, to start off, um, right at the beginning of your presentation, you talk about this idea of interweaving um, and connected threads. Um, and just before we go into the specific specific for the work, maybe you could speak a little bit to this idea of interwovenness as something that's part of your practice, but also as kind of 
a big part of how you're moving through the world as an artist and mm -hmm. someone who's creating work and also working and thinking with other people. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Don. Uh, yeah, it's, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> so, like, the life and art, for me, are very, like, entangled and they're not separate at all. Um, and I think, like, the, the, the thing is, for me, if you know my practice really well, then you can start to see threads from one into the other from very early days, like 1999, all the way to now. Um, so there's a, a layeredness that happens and a past reference that keeps happening. Um, I think what I didn't mention in the presentation is like the work Infinity Flashes of the Past, which is at the National um, Museum, um, was also like an archival work that ended up parts of that ended up in fracture in the photographic uh, bit on the left side. And it was also like the instigator for, I've heard many things about you. So there's these long threads. And I think um, in my life work, like I'm also developing a space called Untethered Magic, which is um, to the, together with my co-founder Kiba Wangunyu. And um, it's also a space for process and exchange um, and, exchange and conversation around practice has always been super key for me and building bridges and not being uh, a gatekeeper mentality which happens quite often in Kenya because um, I think there's this uh, sadly a notion that there's not enough for everybody to go around I think that's kind of been tarnished by the uh, NGO system we have or the donor funding system that exists. I think it's also been affected by um, how gallery spaces came up and who was running them um, in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s. Um, so there's always a desire to connect with many people. And then again, obviously, with my mixed heritage, it comes in another thread of connectivity or understanding uh, two very different cultures, the German culture and the Kenyan culture. Um, in in yeah I have kind of perspectives in that so everything is constantly overlapping and my practice is also overlapping as well in its layeredness in in the process and the practice um again I'm also invited often in science kind of um science and academic forums um social sociologists and anthropologists quite often I've worked with the welcome collection um I've done some work with museums who are dealing with provenance issues so then I'm kind of the, the loner, the lone artist present. And again, I'm, I'm like overlapping and weaving and, and bringing in other perspectives constantly. So that's just, um, yeah, it's an entanglement. <laughs> yeah, and I like the word uh, verflechten. I came across it last week. I didn't know about it. Um, it's, yeah, because it has more than the weaving. It has this um, ambiguity around or a, and a, and a, and a, you can attach the word to meshedness as well, whereas weaving is quite organized and sometimes it's not so organized. Sometimes these threads aren't so clear. Um, so I'm 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 liking that word at the moment. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, good to know more about where you're working from, something to think about around the work. Um, now to carry on with that question of uh, like you said, meshedness. Mm -hmm. um, um, and there's things that kind of recur in the work. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about particular costumes. I think the way the costumes appear in the work, um, in what's such as between us, in what's such as fracture, I think they're working to signal certain social positions and mm -hmm. they're connecting to class, they're connecting to politics, economics, to commerce. Um, and maybe um, you could speak a little bit about how you maybe, how you arrived at this point of using costume as a means to enable these transformations within your work? Ah, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer to that. Um, I think there's, I guess it's a tool to change from myself performatively into the story, um, which is sometimes connected very much in an autobiographical sense. So let me, let me go back a bit. There's a kind of an important work I did in 2007 and until 2009 called Woman, Fräulein, Damsel and Me, which was extremely personal and the performative element wasn't for public viewing um, because it wasn't about an audience interaction and the installation element was available for like the public to engage with, but it had to do with my family history and particularly with my father 
and my sisters. Um, and I feel like I needed to do that body of work in order to move into works like Fracture and Between Us, and I've heard many things about you, where the autobiographical reference isn't so close, but it's present, but not completely, um, uh, it's not completely an autobiographical work. Um, and then the, the the transition, I think it's a tool for me to transition from me as the artist in public which can be me as an artist in my studio is different or an, an artist like in my life is different. But when I'm in a public facing sphere, there's a moment of the transition that happens in the installation in order to tell the story. So I think that's probably where the, the need for these costumes and building characters came about, even though it's not coming from a theater or a theatrical place. And maybe what's important to mention is like, uh, when I was like 13, 14, I was interested in theater, but uh, never quite uh, good enough, maybe. <laughs> and then in my early college years, I was also still like uh, playing around with theater. And there's a lot of kind of um, theatrical imagery in my practice that keeps cropping up um, and kind of the staging and this like lighting um, that's done. You see it particularly in Fracture in the way that the setup for Rose's um, dressing table is done. And um, you see it also in Origins in the way that the, the pieces the, are lit and uh, the shadows. So there's been like this idea of theater coming into play. And I think it's the costumes and the characters are stemming from there, but still quite removed because I don't come from that backdrop. I actually come from like a visual art backdrop and the, 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 the pieces are sculptural at the, I mean, I'm working as a sculptor as well. Um, so I'm like, people think I'm a performance artist, but then I'm actually, yeah, well, it's just a tool that's being used inside of my installations. And the, the fabric is actually quite sculptural. I've gone around in a large loop. <laughs> and we've returned to the fabric yeah. and the sculpture and the object. Yeah. Um, Maybe yeah, sorry, and... I'll just share real quick, like more recently at the end of last year, I was um, invited to do a theater based piece with Casper's Playground. And uh, I told them I'm not a like I don't do like theater. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> like, let's just try it out. And I was like, OK, I wouldn't mind like testing because it's always been a question, this theater element. And um, and I did. And it was great. And it was like. Yeah, the first one was an awful, awful, uh, it was four performances in Amsterdam and Utrecht. And I think the first performance was probably my worst performance in my career um, because I had to like really understand that theater is very, very different from performing inside of a museum space and, and or inside of a public space. Um, but it was a great, like, and then I fixed some stuff and, you know, chopped things up because time is so different in, in a the theatrical setting. And the next nights were, were great and the work is great. But I noticed that, um, A, I needed to test it out to know that that's not the direction that I really want to want to keep running in because people kept approaching me with the theatrical question. Um, but B, I really discovered um, that the performative act is really an act of an attempt of, of, of repair. And that can't be timed. Um, I need to be able to go down like rabbit holes and um, for time, uh, for it to go as long as it needs to go um, is an important element. And I kind of learned that from that modus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I like was also now speaking about the kind of encounter that you're also creating that performative action, that space that you're creating in the objects in there. You've spoken mm -hmm. about them as sculpture, talking about them as also mm -hmm. objects that are made intentionally to function a certain way in a mm -hmm. certain space. Um, and I'd be curious if you could tell us a little bit more. When you were speaking about fracture, you really spoke. Um, you spoke about kind of the thinking behind the costume that you put on to become the mm -hmm. entity. Um, yeah. And I wondered if maybe you could extend that a little bit and tell us about the other also sort of costumes that appear in this uh, work, particularly yeah. the, the headdress that you put on, which I yeah. think there's a conversation we had where. Mm -hmm. um, where you mentioned all thinking about traditional weaving baskets and how also certain mm -hmm. objects transform to become kind of removed from the original use. And I guess really what I'm asking is perhaps with reference to sculpture, but more broadly, could you tell us a little bit about how the development of these costumes happen? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, is it how do you begin and how do you stop yeah. or change as the work 
shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so fundamentally, intuition is always like a primary um, knowledge source for me. Um, that served me super well, even though um, academics have a hard time defining <laughs> how to measure that. Um, but I think with uh, there's a lot of thoughts that came into my mind. Sorry. So there's yeah. So the the entity costume, for example. I mean, I think I explained it in the in the presentation. It's the I really wasn't comfortable to be like dressed in skins, particularly because I'm light skinned. And there's a whole bunch of other references that my body could potentially call upon that I didn't want to call upon in the work. Um, and the headdress is actually being used like in today's time as a lampshade. But traditionally, they were used as fishing nets. So what also happens in my practice and process for several different yeah, for works is that items are reused for other things, but reference new things and old things at the same time. So the past and the present are always kind of um, merging or being cross-referenced simultaneously. And uh, to adopt a use for one thing and change it into another is another element that happens. And the headdress for me was, it. I made the the woven elements that I attached to the um, lampshade slash fishing net were um, dipped in wax. So they also make a noise when you turn your head, it's like, shoo, 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 shoo. and I really didn't want uh, to be uh, so recognizable. Um, in the footage, you can't really tell, but I'm quite uh, horrible and nasty in that first bit. Um, I'm a bit freaky and, the, just an aura that I adopt a lot of people who know me quite well also say that when I perform they can't recognize me it's really because another energy is kind of entering into the space and into my body um, that I've I allow and, and utilize so um, it's quite an aggressive and I needed my head to be covered I just knew that as as like a that was an intuitive need um, because the the act of destroying the vessels is quite um it's raw and violent. And then for Rose's character, uh, she's funny, you know, she keeps coming. Uh, <laughs> so Fracture, uh, Rose in Fracture is also Rose's relocation in a different body of work, photographic work I didn't share with you guys. And also in Between Us, the female character, I feel like she's connected to Rose in a sense, and she's not Rose, but I don't actually have, I never found a name for her. Um, but there's a thread with Rose somehow in, in that. And I just haven't, um, yeah, I haven't pin, pinned that down. So she's kind of in between us in a sense, but I don't really want her to be. I wanted it to be somebody else. But if I'm honest with myself, it's probably Rose. Um, and then what happened to me the first time is that my luggage didn't arrive when I performed it in Finland. So the original Rose's uh, costume was actually bought in Embu. Uh, and I was in a um, a shop, uh, like a street vending uh, place where they were selling a lot of women's business suits. Um, and that was the original Rose's costume, which then got lost in luggage on the way to Finland. <laughs> so I ended up in a secondhand shop in Finland and kind of like finding what I would equate as a typical um, Kenyan woman from Embu, that kind of aesthetic with this kind of the dress is, is a little longer than the knee um, and uh, it's tight at the hips, but it kind of flows out at the bottom. And this this kind of definitely covering and, and closing at the top and everything is kind of um, like secretarial. I was basing it off of, of, off of some Nairobi secretaries I've met and seen. And yeah, so that was the inspiration. And then this really fake jewelry, um, plastic, uh, things that are supposed to look like pearls um, and even in between us and in fracture there's a use of a floor mat which is actually a reference to um, marble floors but people don't have money to reproduce marble floors or tiled floors so you buy the plastic to emulate um, this more expensive living that you're not really living but you want to live so that's very present in 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 fracture as well because she rose has this desire to to she has an idea of what it is to to live in the city 
but then the manageability of living in what is in her mind to live like isn't present uh, isn't she's not able to to do and then the 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 baggage of our history she hasn't unpacked so there's a you know there's a, a double layered not being able to deal with the past and then also this pressure of an idea of how you should be you know you should have two children preferably a boy and then a girl you should have a double storied house you should have um uh, two cars preferably one should be a prado like there's a an idea of what a standard of living a good standard of living should be like and just to add i mean in rose's relocation which is a work i didn't share it, you know she's stuck in in uh mess in france um so the work was traveling just a backstory basically uh, for touring for body talk which koyo ko had curated um so I didn't have access to the costumes uh, for a year. So when we were installing in France, I just said, oh, I can take it now for a moment before I don't have contact anymore. Uh, and I got hired a photographer to photograph Rose in the streets of Metz. So um, she uh, she's superimposed with photographs of the memories of her home that are in fracture. Again, the, the thread coming from one work into another. And um, Again, it's a, it's a story of not managing like this, you know, exodus into Europe and this pressure of of um, sending money back home, supporting people back home, and and yet people don't realize that you're also struggling and alone in 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 your new space. So, and this feeling of of struggle and aloneness is also present in between us, which is why I always feel like it's Rose, but it's not really Rose. Yeah. I, I've also always wondered whether or not that's actually Rosie in between us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see when she <laughs> we'll see when she pops up again. I think this is something I might have asked before. Yeah, um, maybe yeah, because it's nice to mention also the traces on the on the costumes themselves. So each time mm -hmm. I perform fracture, the paint um, that I use in the ceramic vessels is on both costumes, and then I don't wash them. I kind of reuse them. So in the in the entity piece you've got like three or four different kind of tones of red that are there and in in the the roses he hem on her sleeve and on the edges of her skirts you've got that on the bottom of her shoes you've still got the paint so there's also that element that's kind of I, I find that interesting even though I haven't really unpacked it but I like it visually <laughs> I like how when you speak about rose you know you the reference particular kind of dress that they use. you're thinking about Nairobi secretaries, you're thinking mm. about um the jewelry supposed to signal something about one's class, one's position in society. Um, you're talking about how the headdress in fracture also that needs to kind of separate yourself and you enter this energy and enter this thinking that acts in a way that's very sort of different from who you are, is that right? Um, and I think that happens, that transformation is consistent even later on in Pascal, the sort of Casper's playground is you acting as Casper, but then there's also a moment when you kind of shed off Casper the character and you mm -hmm. perform as yourself. And something mm -hmm. that also happens at that point, you also you're sort of shedding off Casper and the part in the performance, and you're also protesting and you mm -hmm. are naked. And um, I wonder, is there is there something you could say there about this um, that in that relationship of moving between a state of dress or a state of being, you know, in costume and that point of nakedness? Um, within the context of the work and performing, and perhaps mm -hmm. even how you think about the subject that you're interested in the work. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of power is, you know, does it give, or is it, what kind of power does the costume have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, there's- and does it take away? What kind of power does make it give you, and what power might it take away? Yeah. Toggling between the two. Okay, so there's there's so much there. <laughs> First of all, that was the the first time I uh, performed as myself when I'm stripping naked, I'm actually not a character, and that's the first time I've done that in my practice for Caspala's playground. It is a very strange transition from Caspala into myself. Um, yeah, it's also the yeah it it is the first time. Uh, maybe it's important to reference that Caspala's costume is actually inspired by the Kaunda suit and that um, the or origins of Caspala, oh gosh, we have to go a little bit back. 
So <laughs> I was invited by the Mark Museum uh, for an exhibition they were doing with Amani, which is, um, Amani was a research station built in Tanzania in 1902 um, near, in the Usambara Mountains. And they had this, it's a Mark Museum is an ethnographic museum. I think that's important to say. Um, and they were having an exhibition about Amani and Germany's uh, kind of reference point to that research station, which became British owned and then East African owned and now is Tanzanian owned. And the station itself is still in existence, but it's abandoned, but it's very well taken care of and still has like four offices that are working from there. So it's not really abandoned, but they have like a library that looks like it's in use, but it's not in use or a lab that looks like it's in use, but it's actually not in use. And they're thinking in the future to use it as a university grounds, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, and they moved the research station into the bottom of the hill. So the hill is like two hour mo uh, motorbike ride downhill. Um, and it's uh, connected to a botanical garden. Um, so the research was in medical, um, looking at uh, ways of producing medicine. Um, and uh, the, the question I had at the time was also, you know, why did the Germans move up into this hill? Uh, and one of the answers could have been because of malaria and also because of um, having military oversight. So the Kasperler's uh, costume is made out of mosquito netting, but the, I, I, I had just completed 1964 to 2018. So the Kaunda suit was still very present in, in, in my mind's eye. And um, it's imitating a Kaunda suit style in, in the costume itself. And then the, the, uh, the okra on the hands and feet, uh, so in the Mark Museum, I really didn't want to bring uh, things from Tanzania into this space and into this exhibition. So I actually asked them for a residency in the Mark Museum as well, uh, which they agreed to and understood that it's kind of a repetition of a violent act um, to just go to Tanzania and extract and then make for an ethnographic space in Germany. Um, and um, Kaspela was kind of, I was playing in Tanzania and sketch performing. And then in, in the Mark Museum, they have this strange room, which is a lecture room, which was used pre-university. So it was used for teaching ethnography where race classification was obviously also taught. And it still uses a lecture room, but it existed before the universities were teaching. We were talking about like 115 years, I think now. Um, and I was playing in there and that's where, and I, I was looking at Maconda masks because um, I was interested in, uh, I was in Tanzania asking uh, lab technicians who were working in Amani in the 70s and 80s what they imagined uh, 1902 would have been like, but nobody could really give me an answer. Um, people could refer to what they'd heard of or what they had experienced, but going further back into an imagination was kind of difficult. Um, and then I asked the curator, you know, what kind of Maconda sculptures do you have? Because I was thinking about Maconda uh, making pre-tourism infection, <laughs> the infection of tourists, uh, changing the way we used to work with Maconda sculptures, which was more coming from a dreamlike state and being guided from, from a dream state and asking permission from the tree to use the wood. And I was expecting to have what I knew of Maconda masks, which were these entangled kind of sculptural many figures. And actually they had a series of masks. And there was one mask I was particularly drawn to, again, intuition, I didn't have a reason, it was situate the label just had Tanzania Mozambique with a question mark on it and then I made Kaspela's first mask uh, inspired by that one uh, and Kaspela has this animal human uh, double seeing double hearing um, a golden mouth golden fingernails and this is a trickster character that I've created to use as a tool to intervene inside of um, colonial spaces but also post-independent spaces to basically talk about things that are hard to talk about or hard to hear and um, the yeah, so the, it, it, the, yeah, anyhow, I've lost my train of thought. Why were we talking about this? Oh, because the costume goes, yeah. So that's how the costume was like developed and built. Developed. Basically. Yeah, and, the, and afterwards the curator was embarrassed about not knowing more about the item, which happens a lot in ethnographic spaces and did her own research and found out that they're connected to medieval masks, which are actually used for transformation. So again, this intuitive knowledge was really like working. Um, and that happens to me repeatedly. And um, when I'm changing from Kaspale into myself for the Kaspale's playground, it's a reference uh, 
the, the mo mother's protest of 1992 was approached, just maybe to give people some context. Um, after doing the work for the Mark Museum, which was uh, an intervention into the archive, and we don't need to get into that because the works are not referenced. But after that, I was kind of wanting to get away from this colonial reference in my practice for a moment, have a bit of a breather, although it keeps coming back to me and chasing me. Um, so I was looking at my birth year, 1979, and um, I was looking at censorship and the self-censorship that I experienced that I also think my generation experiences. And I pinned it back to, um, we kind of were born and raised in Moy's era. Moy is the second president of Kenya. And Nyayo House is um, a building that is a government building and is still um, used for uh, your papers, basically your passport, your identification, your immigration papers. And the basement was a torture chamber um, for 24 years. And the mother's protest happened at the same time as the Saba Saba movement, which was a push for multi-partyism in Kenya. And um, they were pushing to release their sons who were um, illegally or illegitimately captured and tortured in, in Nyayo House, which hasn't been a site of commemora official commemoration yet. There's been discussions to make that into a commemorative space but they were kind of halted. There was also an attempt to erase the evidence of the torture chambers, which failed because it was embedded in the actual um, structural uh, foundation of the building because it's in the basement that they couldn't actually completely erase it. And there's also, I don't know how true it is, but the, apparently this 22nd or 21st floor is also sealed with uh, concrete, but I don't know if that's accurate information. Um, so there's been an attempt to hide this and, and President Moy, the former President Moy, he died in 2020, I believe, when I was actually making Kasperler's Playground. I was actually writing like, what would what would he think of this work uh, as a question? And the next day he was announced as dead. <laughs> so I was like, oh dear, okay, maybe it's a, a little easier to make this work now, but maybe not. I don't know with our current uh, government, it's hard to tell. And I was actually preparing to perform this in a bar in Rongai uh, called Legends Bar because it's a very famous old bar and bars is also where all of our politics are kind of discussed and also we have spies and bars who eavesdrop and the bar is just a very interesting space. So that was the original location for Kasperler's Playground. But because of the pandemic, I, it ended up being first a video edition and now I'm happy to be performing it at Nkai for my solo show with you. Um, but this transition into the the protest, the protest was very important. It was a 10, 10 days long and the, the mothers went to their limits and actually stripped as a, as a form of protest, which is seen as a curse in Kenya to see a mother naked. Um, so there's other references to women being stripped by force um, that have happened in the sixties and happened as, as like early, uh, like late or how you want to say 2015. Um, but, the, and there's a lack of, power with your body with that kind of stripping but there's also this uh, this stripping that's like a resilient in the last resort and that's actually when the police um didn't moved away and and it actually got resolved apart from one person who wasn't released um so yeah it it's the only time i've been myself and um i'm kind of comfortable with it and it is a strange transition in the work because there's no kind of announcement but i do want to honor that protest um, and a lot of pe younger people don't know about Nyayo House in that sense of what happened there. And people from my generation or older have a memory of that. So the work is also to, to bring to the front um, information. It's uh, we don't, some information we don't get, some stories we don't get. And I think my practice is basically uh, pushing for that. Um. I'm conscious uh, of time. time. There are I've, I've rambled. Sort of, Sorry. <laughs> but there are sort of, but I think it's sort of also leading to what we wanted to bring up. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to, following that and following now, thinking about memory, because especially in particular with reference to Kaspale, and I think it's also present in um, the work of, um, I've heard many things about you. Um, there's obviously the sense of collective memory, but also personal memory, 
things that are remembered and the ways in which they're remembered. And something I'm conscious of is in the performances, particularly, and I've heard many things about you also um, in Casper there as well. There's an installation and then there's a performance that takes place within that installation. And then after installation, there's these objects that are left a place in the space. Um, and I'm curious um, what you could say a little bit about, you know, that act of hanging and that act of leaving them. Obviously, um, you know, I guess at a very basic level, you know, you're still leaving an interact an installation for someone to, to interact with. But I wonder whether that perhaps also speaks to certain ideas of commemorating a particular moment, a particular action, and maybe even a sense of a haunting in the space of an event that's come, even there are events that you referenced before mm -hmm. the performance mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, God, <laughs> okay, that's the part. I mean, uh, Traces and remains are like, um, I guess they're a way for us to, to unearth things, right? Um, and I, like I said earlier, I think a lot of these histories that uh, not only I contend with, but I think we contend with on the continent, um, they haven't really been unearthed or uncovered fully. Uh, I was recently in a conference in Hamburg where they were discussing the potentialities of building sites, memorial sites or sites or how to do them. It was kind of like a Kickstarter question. It was really a question about how Germany can deal with its colonial heritage, in particular Hamburg. And um, it's it was very political and un, 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 it felt semi-unresolvable in one sense um, because the narratives that have been put forward are not uh, honest, completely honest. And um, a lot of histories we don't know or don't uncover that actually affect us directly. So something that does happen in my practice that I think is important to say is that the, the, the public and the private, so I'm always interested in how uh, public decision makings affect one privately. Um, is it vice versa too? Um, yeah, I think private decisions can can cause effects publicly. I think um, untethered magic would be an example of that. Um, but I'm always interested in in how these these things are interconnected and to make the personal nuances visible. Um, and then, like I said before, I mean, when I was in Tanzania, I spent some time with uh, scientists who were working in Amani. Uh, and I did a presentation for a group that's not art related at all. And it, in it, like 15 minutes in, I felt like I was really losing them. And then uh, after like in a, a little moment later, one of the scientists were like, oh, I get it. You're like a history book. And I was like, yeah, that's a perfect example. Now, finally, we're, we're getting somewhere, you know, because I was like explaining and explaining and it was felt like I was losing them. And I think that's the point is that there, there, when it's not a lot of information that isn't in our education system, it's not a lot of conversations aren't being held publicly. Um, the fact that youngsters don't know about Nyayo House, for example, is, is evident of that. Um, so I think the, the, the purpose for my practice and for myself is to uncover those things. And I uncover them for myself, but I also hope to uncover them for others and, and be that history book, but in a visual format. Yeah, I hope I've answered you. <laughs> it was a I, very I think you have. big question. I think yeah. you have. Um, we are both ramblers, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> Something to think about. Um, finally, the last stone question, I promise, because you also have, okay. I have two questions here. Um, um, the work of care, I get the sense that this is something that is very, it, it feels almost necessary in your work. There's always at some point some actions um, that speak to this work of attempting to repair or to resolve mm -hmm. or to perhaps restore some form of order or some semblance of mm -hmm. you know some stability um mm -hmm. and i'm curious about why you feel that work is necessary but mm -hmm. also how you think about which characters in the work are the ones to then engage in this work um in in between us for example like you mentioned the two other characters kind of undergo transformations mm -hmm. but then this character who's dressed as a maid she remains in this state of, you know, always being honest, cleaning up and tightening yeah. up. And yeah. then we have in Fracture, Rose coming in and then trying to sort of tidy up or trying to prepare these vessels and trying to, you know, fix essentially what the entity has come and destroyed. And even with Kaspale as well, there's this, you know, there's this breaking down of Nyan House, but then there's also this kind of 
commemoration and honoring of particular actions in history that were done to kind of try and redress certain injustices and certain violences. Um, yeah, why is that work necessary for you? And how do you think about the characters who end up being the ones to do it? Yeah, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, there's a really wonderful um, saying I, I read in one of Whitboy's letters. Uh, Whitboy was, uh, you know who he is, I've done the presentation. So he has a really nice sentence. So he's, I love him because he was <laughs> documenting and writing a lot. He wrote a lot of letters to German generals and British generals and other chiefs. And um, there's actually a book uh, that exists of his letters that you can find in Namibia. Um, and there's a saying he has, carrying the sun on your back. Um, and I really like that saying because, um, I wonder for myself whether it is like the body is strong enough to carry the sun or if the sun is so hot, it's a burden. And that's how I feel in my practice. Like I switch between those two because I don't actually have the answer as to why I've, it's like I'm called upon to do this kind of work. Um, it's very frustrating sometimes. And then uh, also for like Whit Boys, uh, the I've heard many things about you. Um, it's the daughter that I was very um, connected to. So she was, she was, um, uh, Whit Boy was headhunted by the British and, and the Germans. And um, in one of the times when he escaped, his daughter was actually murdered. She was kind of running with him. And they have a log of this and they don't know whether she was between the ages of 17 and 19. And um, I was reading that she kind of cursed the person who was um, who murdered her, basically, and said, you know, you will regret what you're doing in a nutshell. I don't have the quote with me in my head. Um, and, you, you know, you'll be cursed and you need to go back to your own land. And my father will basically like come down on you like a lion, you know. And I thought for a, a teenager and that time of being exposed to gunpowder for the first time is a massively powerful um, position for her to have had the courage to do that. So for the walk, I um, kind of sought out her energy to do the performative element of I've heard many things about you. And when I was first starting the project and I had the kind of concept in my mind, um, yeah, no, maybe I leave it at, at that. Yeah, so there's, there's a, I'm not alone. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not alone in, in the, in the work and I'm not alone in the, yeah, I'm not alone in the work and I don't feel alone in, in that work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Mm, let thanks. me, um, just before we wrap up, let me ask some questions that we have from the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all is, um, what is a what work has been particularly formative for you in practice? Is there one work that can be important? I'll say it again. I was concentrating on the question. Sorry. <laughs> is there and one I'll... work that you, <laughs> is there <laughs> one work that you can pinpoint uh, that you can consider particularly formative in your practice? Oh, uh, yeah. There's well, there's two major ones. One is called Tortoise Atom, which I did in. 2002 in Chicago, which was actually my like graduating piece. Um, and it was uh, a significant because it was it's connected to the death of my mother. My mother suffered from cancer. She was diagnosed at the age when I was eight and she died when I was 22. So a large scale of my formative years um, were kind of surrounded by, um, um, how do you say? Uh, her illness and and this kind of fear of um, the terminalness of cancer. And uh, she had actually died when I was in my last year at university. And uh, Tortus Artem is kind of an, my first installation, actually, um, that also had, funnily enough, it had projections that were moving and sculptural elements and fabric burlap on the on the wall and the sound a rasping sound of breathing that, that I experienced um when I was in ICU with her then uh, uh, her neighbor was having a hard time breathing um so I would think that's like a that was the first kind of 
uh, installation with no performative element, but all the other elements of my installation practice were already present there. And um, uh, stemming from the autobiographical, so like uh, autohistoria term coined by uh, Gloria Alzulda um, was very useful term for me because I was some years ago consistently struggling in the kind of science and academic circles to explain uh, process and and practice in art and validate it, but that being validated. Um, and so I had to build a language around um, those kinds of presentations. And autohistoria is a very useful term um, because it allowed me in an academic sense to, to be like, yeah, this is my process. It stems from an, from an autobiographical standpoint. And then the other one is Cruising Utopia by um, uh, Jose Munoz, uh, which is actually uh, utilized in the queer community, but I've kind of adopted that for myself as well because it, it's um, this allowance to explore and to follow threads and routes. You're not so sure where it's going, and not necessarily starting with a clear frame. Um, and then I would say the other work is the one I mentioned earlier, which is Woman for Lem Danzel and Me. Um, and I think those per two permitted me to now make works that are, are more removed uh, from the autobiographical, still rooted in there, but not so direct. Um, I just wanted to tell Celia, it's Verflechtung. Uh, I write it down for you, but I'm bad at spelling. I'll write it in the chat while you ask the next question. <laughs> um, another question is, um, what, what is the origin of Catalyst, the name? Yeah, super. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kasperle in, in German is the Kasper, the Joker, uh, the trickster. The trickster character is nothing new. It's like in loads of cultures all over the world. Um, and then Pale. Ah, okay. So ha, while I was doing the, the beginning research in 2018 and 19 of this body of work, um, I was uh, very, okay, so Pale in Kiswahili is like there, like just there, visibly there, but not like very close to you. And I was, uh, I then created my own Sheng. So I've got a backtrack. Sheng is basically a language um, that exists in Kenya where you can very quickly define who was born when and where, <laughs> which kind of part of the city you grew up in, depending on your Sheng, you can tell like, oh, they're from this place or they're from that place or they're, they're really old, that happens to me, <laughs> or they're really young. There's like some Sheng like now that I don't understand because it's like completely um, different. It keeps changing. It's a mix of Kiswahili and English and sometimes Kikuyu. What do you, is it, does Kikuyu come into Sheng as well? I I'm think just, a lot of sort of like many yeah. of the major languages that are spoken in the yeah. urban centers feel like as well. Exactly. So I think it's a super uh, interesting uh, tool. It's also a tool for youngsters that was like brought about because youngsters wanted to kind of speak freely for themselves um, in a society where that's not always like promoted or possible. So it's a kind of like also a resistance in a sense. I like that a lot. And so I created my own Sheng out of Pale, as in the English of there, like, do you get it? Like, the. Um, so that's how the word Kaspale came about for the character. And let me write this, Flech, I'm terrible, sorry. Flechten, here you go. I think that's the right spelling. I hope so. Um, another question, um, what do you think is the importance of national identity? if at all oh god um yeah no <laughs> i think it's a total illusion um um like human beings have been moving and migrating and cross-pollinating for eons like since inception i think um the ideas of nationalism came around with the ideas of borders um and it's yeah uh, uh yeah, I'm I'm I I I like multiplicity and I guess sorry, just to backtrack with the Caspale creolization with Sheng and whatnot, I was looking a lot at Glissant and with um I was also reading uh, uh Stuart Hall and his conversation about multitude. They both talk about that actually, and this power in the multiplicity, um, and that you don't lose yourself in in the in the multiple necessarily. Um so I think it's an illusion that we've been conditioned to. I think this um, 
problematics with borders and identity and uh, which place you belong to or don't belong to, which country you can access and you can't access um, is uh, it's a system. And um, I'm, I'm not so interested. I think the, the reference to nationalism in my, in my presentation was just in the, in 2010, the Kenyan government had moved into this desire to um, find a national dress, which I don't think ever succeeded. Um, I don't know, Don, if you remember, it didn't like pass through. And I think it started because we had the um, violence in uh, 207 and 8, that then the government's response was this national dress kind of response. But like we're, we're 42 uh, different tribes, like um, there's not one, 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 it's, it's instead of really addressing the issues and, and, and targeting educational platforms and celebrating our multitude, it was like, oh no, let's 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 find one national thing so we don't have this issue again. Or instead of resolving the real problem, which started with our independence and land not being correctly redistributed from colonial time, um, you know, that's not the case. Or even the fact that a lot of we don't realize that a lot of women were uh, in control of land pre-colonial time. That's like <laughs> I found a one sentence in like one book by by chance about this, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm yeah. Anyhow, I think I've answered the question. Um, um, I think one last question. Um, and I think these two questions kind of fold into each other. Um, what other art forms or media do you draw inspiration from? Um, mm -hmm. following that, um, has science or medicine had an influence in your practice? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um. Yeah, so the science bit, yalla yalla, they always they always want to use art as a tool to communicate, um, which is quite frustrating. Um, understandable because of our lack of, oh, our education system globally is flawed because we're compartmentalizing um, subjects. And actually, you know, there's a, a heck of a lot of chemistry uh, and physics and mathematics in the art practice. Um, if uh, I was a horrible student um, in high school, uh, I liked university, but I suffered in primary school and high school. But um, you know, my and my parents were like, "Oh, do biology, you know, just to get your 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 mark or whatever." And it was like, "Oh, because you can draw some plants." And and actually, if I had done chemistry, it would have served me well, much better with 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 ceramics than um, than <laughs> biology, right? So there's this kind of we don't have this. Um, we don't have good integration uh, of subjects and our education system was built on like an industrial idea uh, and a factory format, which is being challenged and worked on, but it's a very slow uh, changing industry, you know? Um, and uh, so science, yeah. So th there's, a, there's a struggle because there's always this expectation of art being a tool to communicate somebody's data. Or, or this misunderstanding, fundamental misunderstanding. And then there's a uh, very beautiful uh, moments when you get into the psychology or the philosophy um, that I've had a, a couple of times um, with individuals who are like um, coming from that field where we can, uh, there's a definite deep connectivity when we get into the philosophical, philosophical sphere of like mathematics or, or science and that really does relate and resonate very much in both disciplines. Um, uh, what was the other part of that question? Are there any, apart from theater, um, are there other forms? Um, oh yeah. Or really, are there other uh, forms of media that have been? Yeah, yeah. Are so well? lots of photography for sure. Um, and I tend to use photography as a tool to sketch, but I also use it as a tool to create um, visual moving image imagery. Um, uh what else i draw a lot uh use ceramics a lot um the medium is really guided by the research so from the research is the research will start to dictate what material can uh translate um the research component well so the the that's why there's quite a vast uh ray and what I think happens repeatedly in terms of materials is that mirror usage of mirror usage of sisal and usage of ceramics and photography, but um, my practice is very broad uh, 
Yeah, Don Don has been in the studio. He knows he has, has to deal with the show that's coming up. He knows that this these elements are are several. Um, but I would say, yeah, photography, ceramics, and textile work. Thanks. Um, I think um, let me just check one more time to make sure mm -hmm. I don't skip any questions. Yeah, Amani um, is piece in Kiswahili, and it wasn't connected to the research lab in Tanzania. All right, then um, I think um, that's all from me. <laughs> yes, right. Um, thank you so much, Julia, for this um, for this wonderful conversation, for giving us, you know, inviting us into your work and your thought. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure listening to you talk about the work and continue to learn about how you think and how it relates to the greater mm -hmm. world. Um, thank you very much to Elspeth for making this yes, happen, right. in touch, and to the Center of African Studies as well for making this possible. Uh I'm just trying to unmute myself. Um, to, thank you very, both of you, from the bottom of my heart, actually. It was just a very inspiring and generous uh, present, presentation and then discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's uh, look forward to the exhibition that you'll have at ENCA later. Uh, it, it marches, I believe, it's, it's opening. Uh, 23rd. Yeah. That, uh, there, there will be future talks. Uh, in fact, one tomorrow with Sokari Douglas Camp at the at the VNA. That's an in person, as far as I understand. Joy Gregory is coming up at SOAS uh, the twenty fourth, and that's online. If you wish to see her, she has worked in Kenya uh, on a residency in the past. And then the final program so far is with Hassan Musa and Michael Harmitage. That will be both um, in person and online uh, at the VNA in seventeenth of March. But thank you so much. I'm really pleased to uh, have been been with you tonight uh, and everyone else. Thank you. Thanks Asante, so Asante Nisana. <laughs> uh -huh.